Okay, guys, this is going to be our lecture on fingerprints. We're going to do a quick overview of just a few of the main parts of the history of fingerprinting and using fingerprints for identification, uh, and then we're going to jump into the types of fingerprints. What you really need to pay attention to in this video, um, other than all of it, um, is you need to know the three different types of fingerprint classifications, specifically the whorl, loop, and arch. There's also going to be some subcategories that you're going to need to know, but let's jump in. So, the history of fingerprinting. Um, it actually starts with something that's not fingerprinting. Well, you should remember this from our forensic science history. You should remember Alphonse Bartillon, okay? Um, he actually came up with the first major system for identifying people. It was very complex. It went with physical descriptions, and then they would measure your body um, using generally 11 different measurements. You can see some of the picture there, um, that all of the different measurements, including like the circumference of your head and all of these different measurements, and they would use this to identify a person. Um, and so then also another major part is in 1892, um, you had Francis Galton. He published the first textbook on fingerprints entitled, catch this, Fingerprints. Uh, and this started to move things more in the direction, but... Um, anthropometry, that measurement system, stuck around for a little bit longer. Galton insisted that the British government start to look at taking over uh, fingerprinting versus the Bartillon system, uh, and so the next logical step after that is they need to figure out how do we classify these fingerprints. It's great that we're able to, uh, to recognize its ability to identify, but how do we classify it? Um, there's two main systems, and we're going to talk more about the classification system in another class. Um, another class period, but there was Dr. Juan, I think I'm saying this right, Vucetich. Um, he, oh, he created really the first uh, classification system for how you can look at all of the different fingerprints together and, uh, and determine that they belong to a certain person. His system is still used in most Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, then there's also uh, Sir Edward Henry. Um, who he devised another classification system around the same time. There are similar types of systems, uh, but most English-speaking countries still use the Henry method, uh, including, of course, America. It's, it's uh, evolved a little over the years, but, um, but it's still used. Now, what caused uh, the big shift, and we were, you probably remember this as well, uh, was the Will West case. Okay, You see the pictures over there where there were two guys who were in Leavenworth Prison uh, and they were both charged at different times, and they came in and they had the exact same measurements using using anthropometry, uh, and so it didn't quite work so well. However, they did find out that they had different fingerprints. Turns out most of the most the most um, I can't talk apparently uh, most likely that both Will and William West were twin brothers, and so twins do not have the same fingerprints, but they would have similar or the same measurements. After Will West. Um, in 1901, or well, I guess that wouldn't have been after the Will West incident, um, but around 1904 you had uh, Scotland Yard came into the World's Fair and they trained a bunch of law enforcement people on the use of fingerprints and that's when it started to really take root in America. So, what are fingerprints? These, you know, there it says here is they're the reproduction of friction skin ridges found on the palm side of your fingers and thumbs. Interesting fun fact, your fingerprints actually start develop, developing when you were about 10 weeks in gestation, meaning when you are just 10 weeks alive, um, you start to form your fingerprints and they're completely formed by the 24th week. And you will have the exact same fingerprint pattern for the rest of your life. They will just kind of grow larger as you obviously grow larger. Now there's three main principles and you need to know these principles um, that are the basis for fingerprints being used in criminal investigation. One. A fingerprint is an individual characteristic, remember not class, it's individual because no two fingers have yet been found to possess identical ridge characteristics. We have never been able to find two fingers that have the same ridge characteristics, and the ridge obviously being the lines on your fingers. Two, a fingerprint will remain unchanged during an individual's lifetime. And three, fingerprints have general ridge patterns that permit them to be systematically classified. And so those three principles are what we're going to be focusing on. No two people have the same one. They remain unchanged throughout your lifetime. And those ridge patterns that people have, even though they're all different, they have different ways that you can classify them. Now the probability 
it's astronomical that two people would ever have uh, the same fingerprints. It generally goes to like 1 in 64 billion is the number that's used. But even take away the theoretical, we have a, an FBI database that has well over 50 million fingerprints in it, and no one at this point has had, had the same fingerprints. Okay, so here's the main principle here. Um, so the individuality of a fingerprint is not determined by its general shape or pattern, but by the careful study of its bridge characteristics. This is called minutia. Okay, um, and so all of, when you see normally you think of just the swirly patterns on the fingerprint. There's actually these little tiny little um, areas that are that are different, and those minutia are what uh, actually gives a fingerprint its individual characteristics. So if you see on the little black uh, background picture there, it shows the different types of minutia that you would see. Um, the identity number and relative location of these minutia are what actually makes a fingerprint individual. You might have 150 different characteristics on a single finger, but um, each of those different uh, characteristics, like a crossover, an island, a delta, all of those different things um, are going to cause that fingerprint to be individualized. Okay, so um, there was a huge study that was done. There's also been some court cases that have challenged over the years uh, that have tried to show that maybe, just maybe, your fingerprint you know, at that murder scene, it came from somebody else who happened to have your exact same fingerprint. It's never been proved that that's been able to take place. Principle two, when we're talking about how our fingerprints stay the same throughout our entire life, you need to know a little bit about our skin layers here. You need to know, obviously, the epidermis is the outer layer of the skin, while the dermis is the inner layer of the skin. Uh, and what we're actually going to be looking for is the dermis papillae, okay? Uh, and you see, you should be able to see that on the screen there where you see the papillae at. These, this is a layer of cells between that epidermis and dermis. And this actually kind of pushes out on our skin and causes our fingerprints to remain, to, to stick out a little bit. Okay? Um, once those develop, that same pattern stays. Okay? And while this isn't necessarily important just to, to throw this out there so we can understand some things, um, it is actually most likely not the case that your fingerprints are for friction for you to be able to like grip things or climb because fingerprints obviously don't give you a whole lot of friction. Um, what has been determined scientifically is most likely the purpose for our fingerprints is actually to allow us to be able to feel um, that the ridged characteristics allow a more sensory, more surface area to, you know, to brush over things and allow us to be able to feel things better. Okay, so we also have little pores all over each of those ridges that fill with sweat. And that's actually a close-up picture there, disgusting, I hope none of y'all are eating dinner, of your ridge patterns and those little droplets there are little pools of sweat that are on your skin, they're on there right now. Okay, when you touch something, that sweat, that perspiration, along with oils that you have, natural oils from your skin, are transferred. Okay, they when you touch something, it leaves that oil and leaves that sweat there, and that leaves your fingers ridge pattern, which we call a fingerprint. Uh, it's the same thought as the Locard exchange principle. When you touch something, you leave something, and you take something back with you. Principle three, and this is the really important one for class next time. All fingerprints are divided into three classes based on their general patterns. We have loops, arches, and whorls. You can remember that as as law, L-A-W, loops, arches, and whorls. Now some of these get a little confusing because um, the, the names that we gave them were names from a hundred or so years ago, and I probably would have chosen different names for them now. 65% of people have loops. 30% have whorls, but only 5% have arches. And so let's talk real quickly through each of these different types here. A loop must have one or more ridges entering from one side of the print, recurving, and exiting from the same side. I don't know if my cursor will actually show up or not, but maybe it will. And so if you look at that fingerprint on the side, you see that the lines enter from this from the right hand side, loop around, and then they exit, most of them exit on the right hand side. That causes a loop. If the loop opens towards your little finger, towards your pinky finger, that is called an ulnar loop. If the loop opens towards your thumb, that is called a radial loop. You'll want to know the different types of loops there, so please pay attention to that. Towards your pinky, it's ulnar. Towards your thumb, it's radial. Okay, 
Now, one thing that's kind of difficult to, I think, get a really get a grasp on is um, is something called a delta. Okay, because then when you're first looking at fingerprints, this is all going to look the same. And so all loops, when we're talking about loops themselves, must have one delta. This is where your ridge point, okay, uh, you see the kind of the ridge point here, uh, in f where the ridge point is at or directly in front of the point where two ridge lines or type lines diverge. Like on our loop, let's see, where did my cursor go? Okay, on our loop right here, um, looking on the left hand side picture, you see the loop that starts on the right hand side, swirls around and goes to the right hand side. But do you see on the left hand side where it goes through to the left of the page and it exits off the side? Where it is pointing with that line, you see that is called a delta, where two different what we call type lines diverge. And so type lines are, are kind of boundary lines, okay, and in the middle is the delta. You see it also on the plane loop on the right hand side where you have a loop that exits from enters from the left exit from from the left and then has a delta okay before it before it kind of scoops to the right okay whorls this is where it's confusing because some of the whorls are actually called loops I know, confusing they're divided into four main groups the plane whorl the central pocket loop the double loop whorl and then the accidental, sometimes it's called a mixed figure. Okay. A plain world, let's look over here at a plain world, the one on the bottom left. Uh, in both a central pocket loop, they differ from a loop because they have at least one ridge and they have um, they at least and they make a complete circuit. So that's where you have it as as circular. You see that we have ridges, okay? And uh, that the ridge makes a complete circuit. Okay, the double loop is made up of. Um, let's see. Oh, and the central pocket loop. If you look at those at the second one as well, it its ridges make a complete circle. So when you have the actual like little curly Q thing in the middle, the spiral, that's where you have either a plane whorl or a central pocket loop. A double loop is made up of two loops combined into one fingerprint. So if you have something that starts from the left-hand side, exits on the left-hand side, starts from the right-hand side, and exits on the right-hand side, you have two loops together, that's a double loop. That should be easy to figure out. And then an accidental one has two or more patterns, and it just kind of looks all mixed together. Okay, And so that's accidental. That's just mean to say that. Um, it's actually also called a mixed figure. Principle three are arches. Arches are pretty easy. They start on the left-hand side, they end on the right-hand side. You have two different types of arches. One that just looks like a hill, okay, that would be the plain arch, just looks like a hill. And then on the, on the other kind is the tinted arch, where you kind of have this triangle um, tint underneath the arch. It's a lot sharper, okay. And so arches, they don't have type lines, they don't have deltas, they don't have cores, which I didn't talk about cores, but cores are actually the middle of the whorl. Um, and so you don't have anything like that with your arches, and I think that's as far as we're going to go today. But you need to be able to look at and tell me if something is a arch, a loop, or a whorl, and then tell me what kind of whorl it is, or what type of arch, or what type of loop. That's pretty much it. Good luck.